Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. So Antonia and I have been doing some group mentorship recently where we have a small group of a certain personality type that we've been working with personally in a group format. And right now we've been in the midst of working with some INTJs in some mentorship and coaching. And it's really been an interesting experience because we get to connect with you often, people like you that want to do some personal growth work around their around their personality. So it's been really beneficial for us to reconnect with people one-on-one in a virtual setting. Very rewarding. And we believe people are getting a lot of benefit from working this fashion too with us and helping to reframe some things and find some action steps for their life to make some changes they want to make. It's been a really wonderful experience. And so something came up this week though, as we were coaching and working and mentoring with some INTJs, one of the homework assignments we gave last week was a question to reflect on. And we asked the question, we said, we want you to journal and bring this back to the next session that we end up doing with you. Help define for yourself what an exhilarating life looks like. If you could live an exhilarating life, what would that look like? And so everybody went off and did the exercise. And then this week, people showed up with their answers. And it was something really interesting that happened is right out of the gate, many of the INTJs on you know the smaller little uh, hot seat calls, what we call them, where we work one-on-one with somebody in a very small setting, you know, three or four people together. Many people were reporting what exhilarating life looked like. And they, they would start off by saying, well, you know, man, I'm, I'm thinking about this exhilarating life question you have. But man, I just don't know if I want to be jumping out of airplanes, you know, skydiving or, you know, snorkeling or doing extreme sports or something like this. And, and I remember thinking to myself, that really wasn't the question. Like, it wasn't like if you're going to do the extreme sports in life or extreme skydiving in life, we said exhilarating life. And I was thinking in terms of like, you know, a fulfilling life, maybe some travel. And, and, you know, some people did have those answers too. But a lot of the answers were very extreme for like extreme adrenaline filled type things. And after the session, I turned to Antonio and I said, that's really interesting. It's almost as if that inferior process, that three-year-old process for an INTJ, that extroverted sensing has a very binary, extreme viewpoint of the world. When it thinks of exhilaration, it thinks of like the most exhilarating thing possible for itself, right? It's like this, this extreme side of it. And maybe when it's not exhilarating, it's like in a library and very quiet and just reading and calm and, <laughs> and settled. And we started to talk and said, you know what? This binary thinking, this black and white thinking, this overdone, oversimplification of everything often applies to all the functions when they're at the three-year-old or inferior place in people's personalities. So I'm using that INTJ example as a jumping off point. Yeah, we don't want to pick on INTJs or... It's just the way it came up for us. Yeah, or anybody, like everybody who's been in the mentorship group has been amazing. And this is our second mentorship group. We did INTPs first. And when we reflected, INTPs also had the same sort of binary off on relationship with their extroverted feeling or harmony three-year-old or inferior function. So this is across the board and we're going to pick on ourselves too. Oh yeah. Because we did the same thing. Oh man. (laughs) With our introverted sensing or memory, inferior three-year-old. So yeah, this is all functions at the inferior level have a tendency to be very oversimplified and binary in their perspective. And that makes sense because the further down a function falls in what's technically called the stack or, you know, the younger parts of us in our car model, the smaller the territory we take in and the more oversimplified everything looks because the more time we spend on something, the more nuance we're going to see in it, the more territory we're going to take in, the more we're going to sort of understand the complexities of it. We've likened it before to the difference between a coloring, a coloring book and a painting by Renoir. In a coloring book, you have these really bold, thick outlines, these big, thick, black outlines that little kids use to try to stay inside the lines when they're coloring. When you look at a a painting by Renoir, there are no lines. There's just these, these colors that sort of clash into each other. And from a distance, you can see the shapes emerge. But when you get really close to it, it's um, or like maybe a Monet. Monet might be even a better example. And that, of course, is part of the brilliance of these kinds of impressionistic painters. So the further up our a function is in our stack, the more we have a Monet-like relationship with it. We see all of the nuances. Things are not as clearly defined. 
there's not these, you know, sort of more sort of clumsy ways of looking at them. They they have a lot of richness and a lot of exceptions to the rules and a lot of knowing when the rules can be broken and all that stuff. The further down you go in the stack, though, the the more we lose this nuance because we're not spending as much time there. We're not thinking about it as much. We don't understand things in terms of the systems of it and the implications of it. It's just not our sandbox. And so as you go down to the three-year-old or inferior function, the more it's going to look like the bold outlines of a, a coloring book than it is like a nuanced painting from an, an impressionistic master. <laughs> so that takes on a binary feel. It takes on this sort of on-off switch feeling. And because of that, there also is a lot of weird relationship with control around it. We don't really know what the rules are. And so when we try to control these aspects of our lives, we end up going a little extreme in both directions. So we thought what we would do today is run through the list of the eight cognitive functions and talk a little bit about how they show up when they look binary in that position. And there's not that much you can do about it. Like, I mean, there are there's benefits to developing or at least integrating rather. We like to use the word integrating that inferior three year old function. You, you need to have it present in your life and it creates a ballast for the rest of you. In fact, we've done podcasts on the value of integrating your inferior three year old function. But this is more about awareness. This podcast will be more about how some of these things show up so you can have awareness in your life around how your three year old or inferior is showing up for you in this oversimplified way. And then when that happens, just sort of watch for maybe some of the beliefs that come along with it. Sometimes they're limiting beliefs and sometimes they're overreaching and have some awareness around how this could show up in your life. And then, of course, adjust accordingly and also be aware of where the people in your life may be handing power over or maybe grabbing too much power in this inferior three year old function as well, because you might have somebody in your life who is evidencing some of this black and white thinking and you don't know where it comes from. And this could be its source. I've also seen like codependency can come out from here too. You might be around somebody either professionally or personally that handles the aspects of this for you. So you don't have to really think about it because you have like black and white thinking of it. You just like, okay, well, this is, this is how this is handled. You outsource the entire aspect of that inferior process or three-year-old process to another person. And now before you know it, you're not, a, you're not really owning that part of you. You're not owning the things that that would be related to. You've outsourced it somewhere else. Now you've created some codependency in your life. Mm, this is most obvious when it's a thinker-feeler relationship. I've really noticed that thinkers have a tendency to outsource all of their emotional processing to a partner that is a feeler and or even has a feeling function higher up in the stack. Like if you lead with a thinking function as an ETJ or an ITP, it's very easy to fall into the pattern of having another person be who you use to do your emotional processing for you. And it happens the other direction as well. Somebody who leads with a feeling function, like an EFJ or an IFP, they outsource their thinking to somebody who has the thinking function higher up so that they over rely on their logic or over rely on their ability to get things done. So we do have a tendency to outsource. I think you and I have realized by both being E and P's, both of us have introverted sensing or memory as our three-year-old, and there's nobody to outsource it to. <laughs> like both of us just have to deal with it. But I could very much see myself in a relationship with somebody who is maybe an SJ and just loving handing that part of myself over to them, just feeling very taken care of that they're doing all of that work for me. And so, yeah, it it, it can, well, it can be nice to have somebody that handles that in general, but you can't outsource the responsibility of integrating that part of you to another person. Meaning that if your feeling function is your three-year-old or inferior, it's nice to have somebody who might help you process through those emotions with you, but ultimately the work of processing your emotions is your own and you really need to be in touch with that part of who you are. And the same thing with thinking. You might hand over like what your belief or worldview is to somebody else who has thinking higher in the stack. But at the end of the day, you really have to own what your thoughts are and your beliefs and perspectives. And it could be nice to have somebody else organize your world for you. But at the end of the day, it's really your job to be integrating the organization part of who you are. So it's nice to balance each other out with our different personality types. 
at the end of the day, though, we all own integrating this three-year-old function for ourselves. So let's start talking about these at the three-year-old inferior place in your car model or function stack. And let's start with the perceiving functions. We'll go ahead and start with introverted sensing, since we both use that, and Tony and myself have introverted sensing. We've nicknamed it memory. And at the three-year-old or inferior place in the car model or function stack, this shows up very black and white in capturing procedures and often real memories or nostalgic things. Like I, Okay, so like right now in my office, I have a stack of old VHS videotapes and smaller DV tapes, digital videotapes, that I feel a responsibility. They're old like family memories and some photos. I feel very responsible to capture these memories in some way and do it really well. Like I have a scanner in our office, but I can't just scan these here in home in my home office. That's not quality enough to capture these photos. I have to wait till maybe I have the resource or time to sort them, label them, organize them, and then send them somewhere to be professionally scanned at really high dot per inch and full fidelity and then capture them and make sure I've got redundant copies on a hard... Like I have set the standard so high for myself. And, and Tony could tell you, it's like still sitting there because the standard has been set so high in capturing these memories. It's kind of becoming a little bit of a challenge in my life. Like it's, it's weighing me down the burden of this mentally and emotionally but I'm also having a hard time letting it go. Like this is something I'm not able to just go, well, I don't really care. I'll just scan these quickly and just move on. And and this is this is something that my ISTJ aunt, when my grandmother died recently, she just scanned a bunch of photos and just sent them to people and it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> she uses introverted sensing as a primary function. I was like, how can you do that? How can't you do it the, the right way and the full way? So this kind of black and white thinking has shown up in my life in this very particular example as an illustration of how introverted sensing might set standards so high. It's like this binary standard I have of perfection versus nothing. And on the other side of the coin, I traumatized our daughter by throwing away what would have been a beloved childhood relic of mine that she got attached to, but I had zero attachment to it. So it was like a teddy bear from my childhood. And I was like, oh, the stuffing is coming out and I just tossed it. (laughs) So there's this like on off switch. Now, just to be clear, each of the cognitive functions does multiple things. So this binary black and white thinking can be in any of the categories of what each of the functions ends up influencing. So it can be about tangible collections, like relics from the past, and the importance of either capturing them to perfection or completely ignoring their presence or tossing them when maybe that is something you should have kept. But I think you used another word, which was fantastic, which is standard. Introverted sensing or memory also is very in touch with things like standards. And so sometimes it's hard to know when you have this as your three-year-old, it's hard to know what the standard should be. Does this have to be like exactly the way that I've seen it in the past? Or do I have to completely reinvent this for myself? And oftentimes the answer is complete reinvention because that delights our dominant or driver function of extroverted intuition or exploration. Sometimes the binary tells us that we have to completely follow whatever happened before. And in fact, we need to get like 10 more years worth of expert opinion on exactly how this should be. And so there's not a lot of nuance there. There's not a lot of like, well, let's follow the standard. But then when it doesn't work out for us, like be adaptable at that time. Nope, it's on or off switch. And on the flip side, you can see ISJs who use extroverted intuition or exploration as their three-year-old or inferior. You can see them struggling with sort of the photo negative version of this. Either nothing in my life changes or everything in my life changes. Either I completely reinvent myself or I never reinvent myself. Or it could be take all the risks or take no risk at all. And so when it comes to um, this idea of of change and adventure or seeing things from a bigger perspective. There's this idea of you're like trying to take in all of the patterns or you can't see any of the patterns. And that can be that that can be uh, an idealism that gets brought along with this. Or it could be that extroverted intuitions um, optimism element. It's either you're completely optimistic about a situation, to a point where it's unrealistic or you're totally pessimistic about it and fatalistic. And it's hard to have a balance between those two things. So it's either completely on or completely off. 
And that's another element that comes in for ENPs, by the way, that idea of fatalism. Like when you're in that three year old function, sometimes it can be a sense that you don't have you don't have any say in the change of your life. It's either fated to be this way and you can't do anything about it and you're stuck or you have every option available to you. And that's that is the polarity itself. The polarity is all choice, all optimism, all possibilities, all open frames or this idea of set. This is how it's been. This is how we this is the precedent this is how we do things and yeah that's where it gets real black and white on either side of that switch and so ISJs and ENPs in those moments will almost look similar to each other because they'll struggle with the other side of the polarity and trying to figure out what actual balance is. When Antonia talks about polarity we've actually recorded some podcasts and we have some articles and things written about polarities. This is when two cognitive functions are inter- linked together. In other words, you can't have one without the other. So for an ENP, as an example, I lead with extroverted intuition. The opposite opposite of that introverted sensing is my three-year-old or inferior. Those are always linked together. So if anyone has one in their car model or cognitive function stack, they're going to have the other. That's just a, like a rule. And so that's what she means by polarity when she talks about that. Right. So there's a distinction between what I was talking about with binary thinking or what we were talking about with binary thinking, which is on, off, black, white thinking, versus a polarity of cognitive functions. And as Joel mentioned, we've done podcasts on them, so so go reference those if you if you are interested in what that concept looks like. So to move on to the other perceiving functions, introverted intuition, which is the inferior or three-year-old function, we also call it perspectives, that's the function for ESPs, and this also has kind of an on-off switch um, component to it. You're either not thinking about the future at all, right, and thinking, having zero, I, you know, thinking around implications of behavior or actions, or you're obsessing about it. All you can think about is the future, <laughs> and you're and you're almost paranoid about what the future has in has in store for you. That's one way that it shows up in very black and white terms. And another way, and this is something that's a little more subtle, and I don't know if I've really, I don't know if I've really seen this set as much, but I mean, maybe, maybe it has been. It's a matter of either not seeing somebody's, per, uh, not seeing other people's perspective at all, and you only are concerned with your experience of reality, or it's handing your perspective of reality over to another person, which is a little bit more subtle. So an example of this would be I was re- I was watching an episode of Hoarders, like the new season that's on Netflix, and there was a couple, an older couple, where I'm fairly certain that the man was an ESTP and his wife was an ISFP, and you almost can't tell that he's an ESTP because the the context that they're in is. I mean, it's unacceptable, right? This is hoarding, right? Hoarders are, (laughs) when you are dealing with the mental disorder of hoarding, you create an incredibly uncomfortable environment. So you almost couldn't tell that this guy was leading with extroverted sensing or sensation because his moment to moment experience must have been horrific. And he wasn't, he wasn't going to tell his wife that her hoarding, which is, he wasn't a hoarder before he got married to her. His connection with her was so important to him that he wouldn't call her on it. Like the connection of the relationship between the two of them made it so that he would not tell her truth, right? So it was also a compromise of his introverted thinking or accuracy co-pilot in favor of the connection that his 10-year-old had made. He was an enabler. He was an enabler. Yeah, that's the easiest way to say it. And so what had happened is he allowed her worldview, her needs to overwhelm and take over his perspective of reality. So he handed his three-year-old inferior function of introverted intuition or perspectives, his reality, his reality distortion tunnel was completely matched to her reality distortion tunnel. And there's this moment in the show where his son, who I suspected was an ISFJ, he never crossed his father, he never told him the truth, but they were going to lose their house. And so he... 
he sits his dad down and goes, listen, you're going to lose your house in just a couple of days unless you acknowledge the reality of the situation. He didn't say it as, you know, as articulately as that, but that's effectively the message that he gave him. He's like, you're going to lose your house. You have to look around and see this is unacceptable. And what was fascinating is that for this ESTP, the second he let himself Basically, his introverted thinking or accuracy allowed itself to see, re- like, to hear the truth. The second that happened, the clutter around him became completely unacceptable, and he's like, "Throw it away! Throw it away! Throw it away!" And and it was amazing to watch a switch between handing over reality to somebody else and then suddenly taking it back for himself. It was this moment where he was like, he, he just could not stand being in that environment one second more when he finally pulled his perspective of reality back to himself. And I thought that was a really interesting way of seeing how that three-year-old can show up in black and white thinking, where it either takes its own perspective as the only reality or grabs somebody else's and 100% outsources it to somebody else. And that's the only reality. And then we look at extroverted sensing. This is used by all INJs. This is that adrenaline junkie answer I got from some of the INTJs in our mentorship, right? It's this idea of, well, if I'm going to be in an extroverted sensing or sensation place, it's going to be extreme, right? It's like the most extreme version of that, of like jumping out of an airplane versus maybe more of a balance of this, you know, it's like, or it's, or it's my body's just a carrier for my mind, you know, it's either on or off. I mean, there's like adrenaline jumping out of an airplane or I'm using my body to carry my mind around the library, and I think this also can be seen in presence versus not being present. Like it's, I'm present, I'm here, I'm in the moment, in the actual experience, the tangible, visceral experience of the now, or I'm not in that experience. It's a very binary way of, of, of seeing this. And it's, it's a little bit different because it's less, this is very, um, this is the least abstract of all the functions. This is the most concrete in the moment now sensory experience of all the functions. This is less in your head than any of the other functions. So in some ways, there is some binary elements to this, right? You either are present or you're not in some real ways. Well, stuck in the moment, right? Like I'm either stuck in this moment and I can't, I can't get out of it. Like I'm, I'm not just present like in like the healthy, you know, personal development sort of way, <laughs> like mindfulness and presence. I'm either stuck here in this sensory experience or I can't access the present moment. I can't even get there. It's almost like a muscle you can identify. And just to clarify, stuck in the sensory moment could be a feeling of like maybe what a highly sensitive person reports, like this idea that you're overwhelmed by your sensory experience, that it's assaulting you. So either the present moment is assaulting you and you're stuck here and it's overwhelming or you're completely disconnected and you can't get present to that moment. That's another way that it can look binary. I think a third way, because extroverted sensing or sensation is also about action taking, it can be the sense that you have to do something like visceral and absolute and in this moment right this second, uh, or you don't take any action at all. And I think this might be the source, you know, you and I were talking about it, Joel. This might be the source of the famous INFJ door slam, right? This idea that you have to take this like final definitive action as opposed to, you know, maybe resolving conflict or seeing it like in a longer timeline. But that usually happens after a person has taken zero action. So it's, again, a binary thing. No action has been taken for an extended amount of time. And then all of a sudden there's this like final definitive action that even has an onomatopoeic expression to it. Visceral language. Yeah. Slam a door. Like that's like loud and definitive and action taking. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So again, this is sort of this binary on off switch black and white. Either you do nothing about your circumstances or you make this grand gesture of uh, of an action step. And that's another way that extroverted sensing or sensation could show up as this, you know, sort of binary way of looking at it. Now, remember, all four of these functions are perceiving functions. So these are the ways that we take in information. This is how we perceive our world. These don't have should statements attached to them, but they are going to be focused on things like timelines, which worldview you're focused on, what you're perceiving to be reality. That's where the focus is for these. And at the three-year-old or inferior place in your car model or cognitive function stack, 
the viewpoints you take in using that function that's your three-year-old, if you're one of these personality types, is going to be very limited. It's going to be very black and white of how it sees the world from this vantage point. Yeah, things like when to do something and how much to do it and how 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 big or small something is, right? Like those are those are all in, impacted by this perceiving function. Moving on to the judging functions. This is going this is going to be more about decision making and how the world should be set up. So, less trying to get a, an idea of like calibrating you know, what and when. This is more about like the the assertions you have around how life should be set up. And so they're a little, they're, they're trickier. Now, I think what's interesting about the judging functions too is that the introverted or extroverted component of it is pretty important because the extroverted judging functions are very assertive about how the outside world should be set up. Versus the introverted functions that are more judging the individual person's experience. Like it's almost like self-judgment comes in with the introverted functions. And so the self-judgment piece becomes very black and white. So let's start with one of those. Let's start with, say, introverted feeling or authenticity, which is the three-year-old or inferior function for ETJs. Introverted feeling or authenticity is an attempt to be familiar with oneself. It's introspective. It goes inside. And it's a way to gauge what's going on for the individual. But if you're disconnected from it most of the time, then when you go inside to take a temperature of your feelings, you're not going to have as much, you're not going to have like a technicolor experience. It's not going to be like, like you're not going to be well familiar with all of the emotions on the emotion wheel. This is going to be more of a crude oversimplification of the emotions you're experiencing. And this is one of the ways we saw this too. There was almost like literally a binary thinking around what's going on for the individual. Like like a lot of ETJs have two emotions in that they're familiar with. It can either be I'm feeling good or I'm feeling bad. I'm feeling happy or sad. We recently um, heard somebody talking about how there's two emotions. There's either fear or love. And when they said that, I it was funny because Joel's like, two emotions? <laughs> <laughs> your introverted feeling or authenticity co-pilot immediately was like, wait, what? What are you talking about? There's like all these different emotions. And I, I didn't even blink because I don't even think in those terms. But it's this interesting way of making your inner terrain and your emotional experience accessible by making it really simple. I think also this can show up for introverted feeling authenticity at the three-year-old level as motivation even more than reading their own emotions because remember introverted feeling authenticity is focused on the motivations of themselves and others and so then the projection of motivation onto other people is that's a good person motivated by good things or that's a bad person motivated by bad things it's very categorical and it's very black and white either you're a good person or a bad person you have good motivation or bad motivation and there's not the nuance of seeing the intent is intense plural, not one singular intent. There are good parts of us and bad parts of us, and both of those are woven together to give us our motivations. And as you have introverted feeling higher up, you have a sense of this because you can read it in yourself. You see your good motivations and your bad motivations, and you realize, oh, everyone probably has this happening too. But when it's a baby three-year-old process, it's really hard to see that in yourself. It's certainly hard to see that in other people. So that black and white viewpoint there again for the should statements of how things should work or the good and bad intent of someone, very binary. Yeah, which which is why there's probably that self-judgment where ETJs get hard on themselves, that, they're, that they fear they're a bad person. Because if they see any bad, then they are bad, as opposed to understanding that there's a combination there. On the other side, for IFPs who have extroverted thinking or effectiveness as their three-year-old or inferior then you've got this idea of um, productivity versus no productivity. It's either an on or off switch. You're either in massive productivity mode and doing, 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 or you're just switched off and you're sitting around reading your favorite, I don't know, Russian author and eating chocolate the entire day. <laughs> like there's, there's, n there's no middle ground. And sometimes you'll see people almost evidence obsessive behaviors because the fear is that if they ever shut the vigilance off, everything will spiral out of control. So there's this sense of like, I'm either 
highly vigilant about making sure everything is exactly in place and making sure that like everything is organized or I just completely shut it off and I don't think about it at all and the entire world turns into chaos around me. I think another component of this would also be systems. I'm either I'm either setting up the most elaborate system that could possibly be set up to facilitate my life or I'm actively destroying the systems around me and the systems that other people set up that I'm just I'm take I'm trying to take a baseball bat to them because I don't I don't want to have to fit into that system. A lot of these two are like pressure cooker situations where and it probably for all the functions they have this element but for extroverted thinking I can actually think of examples of maybe an IFP who kind of just goes through and is kind of doing life, doing activities and things. And all of a sudden it becomes critical to set up some system in their house or some system in their business. And it becomes all consuming and it has to be the most elegant, complex, end all be all system that can solve all the problems. And it's this over idealized vision of what that system should look like and trying to match that ideal. And that's probably not going to happen, especially if extroverted thinking is your inferior three-year-old. It's almost like it builds up and all of a sudden a switch flips and it's like, I got to build this system that works really well and gets all these things accomplished and sets in, is set up in the most elegant way. And obviously that can't really work, right? You can't just turn that on and all of a sudden that skill comes to you. Just like you, if you're an extroverted thinking or effectiveness driver, an ETJ, you can't just flip a switch and all of a sudden be in touch with all the emotional nuance you have, right? There's that black and white binary element to both of these. I think also, you you know, you made me think of this idea of flip, flipping a switch. I think ETJs on the other side of that polarity also sometimes think that they can control the emotion to just flip it on to whatever they want to feel. I want to feel good and happy, so I'm just going to flip the switch to happy. And there's this, I, I think that that's maybe part of what comes along with the black and white thinking of the inferior three-year-old is this idea that um, it's, it's like this, uh, it's like this childlike idealism around it. And... You, the wrestling is in the idealism of what you, how you can control it and how easy it is to control versus the reality of the situation that sometimes it's completely in control of you. And then it's like, well, do I have control over this or does it have control over me? And should I 100% throw myself into it or should I 100% ignore it? And again, there's like no nuance. There's no elegant dance that's being choreographed like it is with some of your other functions that are a lot more sophisticated. When you get into your driver or dominant, that's a beautiful, elegant dance, right? Like you just, you know when to use it, you know when to not use it. You know when you can break the rules and you know when you have to obey the rules. Like with that function, there's so much nuance and so much elegance of, you know, of expression, particularly if you are not just using it, but developing it and exercising it. I think that there's there's so much to it and it's so rich. When you get to its polarity opposite, it's weird how much of a desert it is <laughs> and you just don't know what the rules are. Why don't I know the rules? And so a part of this is um, the illusion of control you have over it. And oftentimes the illusion of control comes down to compartmentalizing it and just totally ignoring it. Or again, actively attempting to destroy experiences of it like the trying to take a baseball bat to systems that are built by others or the idea that you can completely repress your emotions and put them in a box and kick the box under the bed or this idea that you don't have to follow any of the standards or precedents set by the past like ENPs or this idea that you never have to think about the future for introverted intuition or this idea you know like going on and on and on like this idea that you can 100 percent just put it away and then all of a sudden you have to deal with it and then now now it overwhelms you. So there's there's just a, a lot of um, of challenge in in knowing what the best course is for that inferior function. So if you can watch yourself and observe your behaviors around it, you can start to create more strategies to go, okay, well, uh, as an ENP, I'm in my introverted sensing or memory function and that means that it's got a hold on me. This is, of course, what we talk about with grip experiences. And I'm going to have a tendency to be over idealistic around this. And maybe I should look for behaviors that sort of help me integrate this, which we've talked about in other other podcasts, um, or just maybe find somebody that can help me create a system around it. Okay, so the final two 
are the judging functions of extroverted feeling and harmony and introverted thinking or accuracy. So let's go with the extroverted feeling or harmony three-year-old, which is um, which is the inferior function for ITPs. So this is this is a fundamentally about energetic connection with other people and the ability to emotionally express. And I've noticed that ITPs, one of the ways that this turns binary for them is either they are overdoing it in relationships to maintain a connection because the connection is so precious and it's hard to connect with other people that they end up in these like codependent relationships where they are 100% serving in order to have this, you know, to keep this connection and they're, and they're exhausting themselves to do so. Or they have convinced themselves that they don't need connection at all and they almost divorce themselves from the rest of society and act like they can literally be in, well, not literally, but be an island in the John Dunn style. So there's also the other side of this too, where, you know, it might be serve, 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 or at least defer, defer, defer. I think that's actually a better word than serve is a deference, especially if uh, ITP is in a relationship or a friendship or some arrangement with somebody that has more emotional access, right? They have more emotion. They might outsource that. They defer to the other side. But then all of a sudden that deference stops and it switches to demand. It like, this is this is my need now. And I demand that that's met on this side. It may be unconscious. It may not be a, a verbal like, I demand this. It might be a expectation all of a sudden, a black and white, almost childlike expectation of, okay, I'm not going to defer in this moment. In fact, you're going to defer toward me and I need this right now. And that can come out in a lot of different behaviors depending on the person. Yeah. Well, I mean, an example of this would be that we had a we had a roommate at one time. I had a roommate that was an ITP and there was um, there was a meeting that we were doing next to the ITP's room and it was like 11 o'clock in the morning. And so there was no expectation that we would all be quiet because this person was sleeping because it was like 11 o'clock in the afternoon or in the excuse me in the morning, almost noon. And they came out so upset that we were having a meeting near their room and making noise because they were trying to sleep. And th- they weren't employed at the time. Like they they didn't, it wasn't like they were a night, you know, they didn't work nights. They didn't work in the evenings. They weren't working a swing shift. It's just that they had decided that they were going to sleep in. <laughs> and they had decided they were going to sleep in every day. And it was like, but this is this is the place in the house where we can meet because we all had a meeting that, quite frankly, they were actually supposed to be at. <laughs> they decided to sleep. <laughs> and there was like this weird... There was this weird demanding nature to it, even though it didn't make sense for anybody else. It was like, and and you've seen, you've seen that too. Like the ITP like sleeps on the couch in the common area, and other people are being noisy. But it's the middle of the day in a common area, and they expect everybody to be quiet so that they can sleep on a couch. And it's like it's just such a weird demanding part. When the other side of that is like you mentioned, deference and serve, 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 serve. So it's like this weird like. Like, what are the moments in which I can make my demands of my needs? And what are the moments in which I stop meeting other people's demands? And and the unawareness of when those are showing up for you is really what it is, Mm -hmm. you know? I I think one more component to this, too, is how much they're going to care about, um, like, like social things. Like, uh, like how much they're maintaining vigilance around whether or not they're observing social rules and when they just stop caring at all. Um, I've had an INTP tell me that mo- for most of their life, anytime they wondered what behavior they should be doing, they stopped and asked themselves, wh- you know, where what would everybody else be doing? Where What would everybody else be doing in this situation? And then I'm going to match my behavior to them, which is because there's no, there's no familiarity with the rules. Yeah, it's just totally deferring to societal expectations. And then on the flip side of that, just kind of giving society the bird and going, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want to and I don't care because the rest of society is stupid. So again, it's this black and white thinking when it comes to, you know, understanding all of the different elements of how harmony or extroverted feeling shows up. We move over to EFJs who use introverted thinking or accuracy as a three-year-old inferior process in their car model or function stack. And in this way, it is this sense of truth versus not truth. It's an on-off switch of, I'm going to tell it how it is, and I'm going to give you the raw, 
real truth you need to hear, or I'm probably going to obfuscate the truth. I'm going to lie or misdirect or pull back from the truth that I see in the moment. And it's almost like this on-off switch of truth and truth-telling. Yeah, I think it's what is the value of truth? What's the importance of it? And it's either so important that, you know, I got to tell you how it is, even if maybe that's not the moment in which somebody needs to be called on something. It's almost like a selfish need to articulate what their truth is as opposed to serving another person by telling them the truth. It's like they've gotten something bottled up inside of them, something they may maybe haven't been saying, and now all of a sudden they have to say it, versus there's no value to truth in the sense that nobody ever needs to be called on anything. And of course, one leads to the other. The withholding of what they believe is accurate information or truth-telling, withhold, 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 and then all of a sudden they must. It's kind of similar to the extroverted sensing or sensation component too, where you ignore something for so long and you don't do anything about it. And then all of a sudden you must do something about it. And I think there's a bit of that black and white off on switch for introverted thinking as well. There's a little bit of an insecurity here in that black and white thinking for introverted thinking inferior three-year-olds. EFJs sometimes wonder, like, I'm either smart or I'm not smart. I either have intelligence or I don't have intelligence. There's no middle ground. There's no nuance to thought. Either I'm a smart person or I'm not a smart person. And sometimes there can be this strive to get a sense of, no, I'm a smart person too. And it's this little part of you, this little childlike part of you, striving to prove that you've got some smarts too. And it's this very, again, binary way of seeing it. Like it's either there or it's not there for yourself and others. Kind of like the introverted feeling in fear of three-year-old. You know, somebody's either a good person or a bad person. Sometimes introverted thinking in fear can say this person's either a smart person and thoughtful or they're not smart or not thoughtful. Yeah, I've actually heard a lot of EFJs be quite judgy about how smart and not smart other people are. Like, I hate it when people are acting like idiots. I hate it when people are idiots. And it's like, well, people are just doing what makes sense to them. And I think that the EFJ would normally feel that way, but then all of a sudden they're just like, they, they just have this very binary view that people are either idiots or they're not. And it almost looks like having introverted think thinking higher in the stack in some ways, <laughs> right? Because people who are ITPs and ETPs have a tendency to like be disappointed with how other people think. It's like a sense of disappointment. But then eventually you get to a point where you're like, well, no, people aren't idiots. They're just working with the information they have. But the further down the stack it is, the less the EFJ knows how to deal with that kind of disappointment. Like they've given everybody the benefit of the doubt to start out with. And then people are disappointing to them in how they think. And now people are idiots and stupid and disappointing. Or at least that's that's the the black and white view of how they deal with that sense of having given them the benefit of the doubt and then been disappointed by them. So quick note, these are just some access points. These are some ways to look at all eight of these functions at the three-year-old or inferior position. This was not a comprehensive list. It was not comprehensive. So if you don't identify with one of these, A, it might just be a blind spot so you don't see it in yourself. But B, it also may not be your experience. There might be another nuanced way this shows up for you that's not like what we just articulated. So these are access points we're giving you, starting points to look at this and start to see, okay, I can see that showing up for myself or people that are this personality type. I can, I can kind of identify that. I understand how that's showing up. I, I think what's nice about being aware of some of these, these behaviors and how it can show up is number one, you cut other people some slack, right? Like if it's all of us have one of these, all of us have an area where we're coloring books and not Monet's. And so if you can identify what yours is, then when some other personality type is evidencing their version of it, you can have a little bit of compassion for what they're dealing with because you know how you deal with yours. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is to remember that a lot of the black and white elements come out because we're feeling really insecure. It's just a sense of insecurity manifesting and then us overcompensating for a feeling of insecurity. And it's valuable, I think, to be willing to sit in a place where you just go, you know what, I'm not that good at that. And you don't, acknowledging you're not good at something is not the same as feeling insecure. 
you can feel insecure about a thing or a characteristic or some element of you. You can feel insecure in the in the sense that if I lean on myself in this way, I might not always make the best choices or I might not feel supremely safe. But that doesn't say anything about you as a human being. So you don't have to feel holistically insecure about who you are simply because you're not all things to all people. And there's some value in having modesty, like acknowledging that you're really good in some ways, you're Monet in some ways, and in other ways you're not because that was the cost of specialization. So being willing to sit with the elements and areas where you're not that great and just accept it, own it, you know, own that you're, you're, you just don't have time in, a, in your lifespan to get amazingly good at everything and then accept that about yourself, like sort of surrender to that. And then once you do that, once you go, you know, I'm just not great at that, that doesn't mean that you, it doesn't mean that you ignore those aspects of your life. And it doesn't mean that you're ignoring that part of who you are. There's a way to integrate your three-year-old or inferior function without having to try to overcompensate for it. So I think what we're really talking about is to be aware of the ways in which you bring insecure black and white thinking, ways in which you might be a little clumsy, ways in which you might be beating yourself up and then trying to prove something to yourself because you're beating yourself up for being a little clumsy. I think the solution is being aware of how it manifests for you, owning that manifestation, recognizing it doesn't say anything about who you are as a character or as a complete person, and then looking for opportunities to integrate that part of who you are, that in three, that three-year-old or inferior function, integrate it in a healthy way, which again, we've done podcasts on ways to integrate the three-year-old function, and, and not use the evaluations that the three-year-old reflects back to you. Like, like don't, don't trust everything it's, it's pinging back to you around. Like if it's making you feel judgmental of yourself, if it's making you feel like you're a bad person, don't don't listen to its judgments. Don't listen to the parts that say you should be doing, you know, like you should be better at this than you are, or you're a bad person because you don't have this on lock. Like just go, you know what? That just is what it is. <laughs> I'm just going to accept this part and I'm going to look for strategies to do better. And I'm kind of I'm going to cut myself some slack and I'm I'm going to realize that I've got all this cool stuff over here. Once you get to that point where you can really contend with it through making the unconscious conscious and watching your behaviors and 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 accepting yourself despite them and doing better anyway, once you get that that you know sort of uh, algorithm down, it's so much easier to do that and provide that service for other people. And then you just grease the wheels of all the relationships in your life. So these are some things to be thinking about. As again, you're on your personal growth journey. We like to talk about personality types as related to how you can use that access to yourself to find a journey of growth forward in your life. How can you use your personality to get leverage on yourself and start to grow and become the person that you know you want to become? That's really what our passion is here. And so we want to hear from you what's been coming up with, for you in this conversation. As we've been talking about your three-year-old or inferior process, what's resonated? What has brought up some questions? What's brought up a story or an experience you've had that you could share with us and the community here at Personality Hacker? And we can have everyone benefit from your voice and learning from you too, making your voice heard. Come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode. Below this show, you can ask your question, leave your comment, or more importantly, share your story or experience so we can get a sense of what's coming up for you and how you've experienced this in your life. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you would leave us a rating and review on iTunes, that's super helpful. It, it really is. It's like It's like gas in the car reading the good reviews it's like okay we're doing something cool here or at least some people are enjoying it so let's keep going so part of how we keep going is reading your ratings and reviews particularly if they're the good ones <laughs> so go leave a good one <laughs> we also have a book available it's called personality hacker it's at all major online reta- retailers amazon books a million etc and if you enjoy the book you can leave us a rating and review for it on amazon and that also helps us out a lot And if you would like to continue your growth journey, we have a bunch of really cool programs at personalityhacker.com under the catalog of programs and products. 
If you find something that is right for you and you want to invest in yourself and your growth journey, go check those out. There might be something that really speaks for you to you and is perfect at this time period in your life. My name is Joe Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. <laughs>